The neighbors tell police they saw some shadowy figures running through a popular walking trail surrounded by a wooded area. The neighborhood is pretty much a circle. Then you cut through a wood, you're on another street. The team's next step is visiting the trail to see if the perpetrators left any evidence behind. In walking the trails yielded no forensic results. But the trails lead deeper into the neighborhood, and the suspects are running towards the middle, back into the subdivision. It led us through some trees and wood line and all that, and came out on another street. So we believe that that was the route that the perpetrators fled. Our patrol units got there within four minutes of the 911 call. They did not observe any vehicles leaving at a high rate of speed. Therefore, it was a safe assumption that the perpetrators lived inside the subdivision. What many people thought was just a one-man band, now they realize that it might be a gang of people in the community. That was terrifying. Investigators must consider the possibility that Pamela's murder isn't the first crime these perpetrators have committed in Amherst. The team combs through police records from the past several months, and they discover there's a dark underbelly to this picturesque community. Though Amherst was a quiet community and a well-to-do community, they've been riddled with burglaries maybe for the past two years, from 2011 to 2013. They've had no fewer than, I would say, 75 burglaries. All the previous burglaries have been just property crime, but nothing violent. Detectives assess that this two-year cluster of nearly identical burglaries in the same wealthy neighborhood must have been perpetrated by the same robbers, and that the break-in at Pamela's house fits the M.O. Suspects in this case have upped their game from theft and burglary to murder. We surmise that the person that shot Ms. Williams didn't want to leave her as a witness, hence the press contact to her head. So a burglary trying to cover up the tracks, that's the direction that we were going in at that point. A number of people had experienced home burglaries, but it had not risen to what the Pamela Williams case had risen to. They were worried before, because you're going to break in my house. You're going to take my property. OK, that's a problem. But now you're going to break in and kill me? And so now people are really scared. As lead detectives Hamilton and Smith continue researching burglary cases surrounding Pamela's home, they uncover another recent victim from a nearby neighborhood whose case bears a shocking resemblance. The case that had occurred approximately 12 months prior. And it involved a, um, a woman by the name of Melissa Burke. Melissa Burke's case was almost carbon copy to the Pamela Williams case. Female home alone, female calls 911, female gets shot while on the phone with 911. While the crimes are strikingly similar and about a year apart, there's one important difference between the two. Angels were smiling on Melissa Burt that night because she ultimately recovered from those injuries. At 10 p.m. on January 3rd, 2013, Melissa called 911 from her home in Chestnut Ridge, approximately five miles from Pamela's residence. My husband was traveling at the time, so I was in the home alone. I was in my pajamas, ready for bed, winding down from the day, and the doorbell rang. I wasn't expecting guests. I didn't answer it under the assumption that they would go away, and the doorbell rang again. And I, this time, I got out of the bed to look out of the window, and I saw two young men walking away from the porch. I didn't recognize them. Several minutes later, I'm upstairs in the master bedroom, and I can hear the noise coming from one of the bedrooms down the hallway. And I can't make out what it is, and then I realize someone's coming in through the window in the bedroom. I can remember calling 911, and I do remember saying, 
someone's trying to break into my home. So I went into the closet in the master bedroom and I heard footsteps all over the house. I said, there's more than one. And I can tell you what I was doing in that closet. I was praying to God for my safety, praying that they would just go away and not find me. But they found me. Backing up to the Melissa Burke investigation from 10 months earlier, in the stolen Honda where Cahoon drops his phone, there's a letter in that car. You process that letter, there's a print. The print comes back, not a hit, no match. Fast forward 10 months to the Pamela Williams investigation. Knowing what we know now about the suspects, James Calhoun, James Sims, Jonathan Banks, we take a shot and run that print again on the letter. This time it comes back to a hit. The fingerprint revealed a positive identification of a young man named Marcus de Barrios, who was known to law enforcement as having a connection and a relationship with the perpetrators associated with the Pamela Williams case. We brought him in for an interview with his parents, and it was during that interview that Marcus de Barrio was offered immunity by the district attorney's office in exchange for his truthful information and testimony if called upon if we went to trial. So Marcus de Barrio gave uh, an encyclopedia full of information about the people who were involved in the murder of Pamela Williams, as well as the shooting of Melissa Burke. The witness says that during the Melissa Burke incident, Calhoun, Sims, and Banks are there as well. That was crucial information in tying in the two cases with the exact same players. Again, with a lady being shot in one and a lady being shot and killed in another one. The witness says Calhoun went upstairs on Melissa Burke's house and shot her multiple times. And once Miss Burke was shot and once the vehicle fled and everybody ran away and escaped from us that night, this witness said that he distanced himself from them. So we got Calhoun allegedly shooting Burke. We have Banks shooting Pamela Williams. But we have all three, Calhoun, Banks, and Sims, in both houses. But in the Burke case, even though the witness did name Sims, Calhoun, and Banks, you have to have at least one other piece of corroborating evidence. Calhoun tries to reason with detectives questioning him, explaining that he comes from a good family. James Calhoun is a very interesting person, comes out very charming, almost exclusively always smiling while he talks, soft-spoken. James Calhoun actually had the opportunity to attend the prestigious Morehouse College here in Atlanta, Georgia uh, on an academic scholarship. His mother was employed uh, as an assistant to one of the academic deans at the, at the college. He had every opportunity to choose a different life path. While Calhoun tries to convince detectives that he wouldn't throw away his bright future, they're still suspicious of him. He was a neighborhood kid who had committed burglaries, but nothing violent, nothing violent. Calhoun had been caught in a neighboring subdivision in Walton Park where he was suspected of a burglary, dropped a school ID in the victim's uh, den. Fulton County Police Department had arrested Calhoun multiple times. When I found out that Calhoun was allegedly involved in shooting Miss Burke, to me, that changed my opinion of him. You could just tell by listening to that 911 call that Pamela knew she was in danger. It's just hard to comprehend that she was not safe in her home that she had worked so hard to get. It was heart-wrenching and heartbreaking, and it was something that I don't think that community will ever forget. The first time I heard the 911 call, 
I recall sitting in silence as I tried to really absorb what it was that Pamela Williams must have felt. It was the most traumatic phone call that I had ever heard in my career. And so it left a very deep impact on me. And so a lot of these actions by these defendants, in my opinion, really gave me enough ammunition that by the time I got to the trial, I actually called them. The Amherst Death Squad, you broke in our house late at night when the likelihood that somebody is at home is greater, right? This was Thanksgiving weekend. This was Saturday night. This is when people are sitting at home, they are full off of turkey and dressing, they're relaxing, they've been watching football all day, and the likelihood that somebody is gonna be at home is greater. Then, if you picked a random Tuesday during the week and broke into somebody's house at 11 o'clock in the morning when most folks are at work, and you bring a gun to a burglary, why? It's because you expect to encounter somebody.